Hello and welcome, this is Mouse Gunner, and in this video I'm going to be covering hammer fired actions in firearms. Now the hammer fired action is quite an old system dating back to flintlock firearms which use a type of hammer fired action. In the course of this video I'm going to focus predominantly on modern styles of the hammer fired action, starting off with the Colt single action army, which although it is quite an old firearm, when you consider the fact that the system used in the Colt single action army is similar to that that was used in cap and ball revolvers that predated it, even in it, it is not a new system. The Colt single action army is, as the name implies, a single action type of the hammer fired action. Now what that means is that the trigger only accomplishes one task or action per trigger pull. In the case of a single action firearm, whether it be a revolver or a handgun, the trigger will only drop the hammer forward. But with the hammer already forward, I can pull the trigger all day long and nothing will happen. But with the hammer cocked back, which I have to do manually, if I pull the trigger, the hammer will drop forward, completing its single action. And to explain how a hammer fired action works, it's important to first point out the two key components of any hammer fired action and that is the hammer itself and the sear. Now in the example of the Colt single action army the sear is actually attached directly to the trigger as the system used in the Colt single action army is very simple in its mechanics. Hammer fired actions use a ratcheting mechanism to control the movement of the hammer. The sear acts as a ratchet tooth that fits within notches, which we can see here, cut into the hammer itself. And if we slow things down, we can go ahead and see the cocking happen happening. So our sear is bouncing along and then falls within the last notch on our hammer fitting in there and locking the hammer back into its fully cocked position. Now you might have noticed a couple other notches within the hammer. And this notch here is what is used for the half cocked position, which will lock the hammer back into a partially cocked position, which is a safer way of carrying the firearm when it's not ready to be fired. Uh, as if there is a inadvertent drop of the hammer, you're not going to have the full force blow that you would with a fully cocked hammer onto the base of the primer. And although you could potentially still set off the primer, it's a lot less likely than it would be in the fully cocked position. And it is also used in the Colt Single Action Army to put it into a position where you can manually rotate the cylinder during reloading. So it has another purpose as well. Let's go ahead and take a look at what happens when the trigger is pulled. So again, with things slowed down, go ahead and pause this so we can take a look at this in a lot of detail. So again, the mechanism is very simple here. We're going to pull on the trigger, and as the sear is directly attached to the trigger, it will pivot along with the trigger. And as it pivots, it's going to remove itself from the notch in the hammer. Now, the animation in this program is a little sloppy. Honestly, the second this sear leaves connection with the hammer the hammer should move but it's a little delayed in the animation but more or less the second we have that occur the spring the main spring within the firearm which is a big flat spring is going to act upon the hammer pushing it around and down onto our primer. And that's more or less all there is to the mechanism. And to fire again, once we've depressed the trigger, we're going to have to cock the hammer manually. What returns the trigger back to its normal position is its return spring right here, which is another flat spring. And it's also what's going to push it into activation with the different teeth. So if we come back here, 
we see normally that spring is going to push up on it and make sure that that sear is going to fall into the notch. That's all there is to a single action system, at least in the Colt single action army. Just a very simple mechanism of a sear holding the hammer in place. And all you have to do to drop the hammer is just pivot the sear out of the way and then the hammer is free to move. Now I discussed earlier that the half cock notch was a safer way of carrying the firearm. It's even safer than just carrying the firearm with the hammer in the fully down position because in this position the firing pin within the hammer is resting directly upon the primer. And if a blow were to strike the hammer here it could potentially set off the cartridge. So in the half cock position you would actually have to break connection with the hammer and sear for the hammer to drop and then potentially fire off the cartridge. So it's considered to be a little bit safer. But still, as you can see, the connection between the hammer and sear is really not that firm. But you can see with the half cock notch, for instance, the full cock notch is just a straight ledge. But with the half cock notch, as we bring that around, it's actually a much more angled surface, so it locks in there a little bit more solidly. So that it's a little bit safer and a little bit harder to trip off inadvertently. But even still, it's not a perfect foolproof system, but it's better than nothing in a firearm, in, in an era where firearms did not have any other form of safety. In any case, that wraps up our look at the Colt Single Action Army, and we'll be moving on to our next example. The next example we're going to look at is the Colt 1911. And although it is a single action firearm, just like the Colt Single Action Army, as you can see probably already, it is quite a bit more complex. First off, the trigger is all the way over here, and our sear is all the way over here. And there seems to be quite a bit going on over here with the sear. And a lot of that is necessary because the requirements of a semi-automatic firearm are quite a bit different than those of a revolver. Even with the added complexity, there are similarities between the two. For instance, there's still a ratcheting mechanism going on with the hammer having notches cut into it that the sear fits into like a ratchet tooth locking the hammer back in place until we have pulled the sear out of contact to allow the hammer to freely move. It is how the sear is moved that is a big difference, but one of the main elements of difference is going to be caused by the actual function of a semi-automatic firearm itself. With a single action revolver, you don't have to have a mechanism to hold the hammer back while you're holding in the trigger. Because with a trigger pull, there's nothing going to automatically cock the hammer back in between shots like what you'd have with a semi-automatic. When you pull that trigger, the slide's going to come back and automatically cock the hammer for you. So you have to have some mechanism to still hold back that hammer while the trigger is still being held in. Without this mechanism in place, there's nothing keeping the hammer locked back when it is cocked automatically by the slide. So as the slide comes back, it would cock the hammer backwards, but if the trigger is held in and there's no mechanism to keep that hammer locked in place, the hammer would just go forward with the slide automatically decocking itself, defeating the whole purpose of it being automatically cocked by the slide in the first place. This is what allows fanning in a single action revolver. Fanning is the process of holding in the trigger, deactivating the sear, and preventing it from locking back the hammer when it is cocked, and then pulling back the hammer and letting it go. And when you let go the hammer, it's just going to fall forward as nothing is locking it back. And as it falls forward, it will fire the cartridge. And you can do this in quick succession. As fast as you can pull back the hammer and let it go, you can fire off a round. This is not something, though, that you would want to have happen in a semi-automatic. First off, as I explained, if there was nothing holding the, the hammer back, it would just come forward with the slide and it would lose all of its energy and it wouldn't really have enough to reliably transfer 
that energy to the firing pin and then to the cartridge to set it off, which is not really what you want to have happen. And as the cycling of the action happens in the blink of an eye in a semi-automatic, you really don't want to leave it down to the reflexes of the user to let go of the trigger before all of this occurs to allow the firearm to function reliably. With all that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at how this actually works. So, with the trigger pull, we see the sear being pivoted out of contact with the hammer. This one actually being at correct timing as soon as the sear disconnects from that hammer. The hammer drops forward. Our slide cycles, bringing our hammer back. And then our sear holds the hammer in place, preventing it from dropping forward. As I explained, even if we were to hold in the trigger at this point, we are not deactivating the sear with that trigger held in place. Let's actually see what causes all of that to happen. And we're going to actually have to look really closely at the sear mechanism. And if we look closely, we can see it's actually a two-part interaction that gets the sear to do what we need it to do. We have the sear itself, which is this outer part. Unfortunately, the two parts are the same color, so it might be hard to make it out. And then we have an inner part here, which I'm going to refer to as the detent, and it extends all the way up to here. Now, these two parts interact because of a surface area here on the inner part and here on the sear. Now, as the trigger bar pushes back, it's going to push on the inner detent. But because of the contact between the detent and the sear, it is going to act upon the sear to pivot it out of contact with the hammer, letting the hammer drop forward. And as the slide moves to the rear, the detent gets pushed downwards. This disconnects the two parts from each other. No longer is this surface area contacting this surface area on the sear and forcing it to move. What causes the detent to drop is the fact that there is a cutout in the slide here so that when the slide is in its fully forward position, the detent is raised to the top. But when the slide starts to move backwards, quickly the slide pushes down because no longer is this cutout allowing the detent to be at its uppermost position. It pushes it downward, disconnecting the detent from the sear. This allows the sear to act independently now and no longer be affected by the pull of the trigger as the trigger cannot actually contact the sear. And because of the sear's own spring here, it will act just like the sear on the Colt Single Action Army forcing the sear to lock in place in the notch in the hammer, which we can see as the slide comes forward, the hammer is going to drop forward a little bit. But if it wasn't for the sear locking the hammer in place, it would have continued to drop. But because the, the sear can act independently, it will lock into the notch in the hammer, preventing it from falling. And as soon as the slide comes all the way forward, our detent will come back up into that cutout. And it is forced and placed by its own spring. So you can see there's a flat spring here. Honestly, these, these springs are one piece, but they do separate into three flat springs. And this flat spring here is going to act upon the detent. So while the detent is being pushed down, the spring is pushed to the rear here. But once the detent can come back up, the, the flat spring here is going to slide along this angled slope here, pushing forward and moving that detent back up into position, locking it in, in, into contact with the sear, allowing the trigger to then be activated again. And this only occurs when the detent comes up, which means 
the slide is moved up into battery. So this also prevents the firearm being fired out of battery as the trigger will not activate the sear until that occurs with the detent coming up into the cutout and the slide. So not only does this allow for the hammer to stay locked back, it also ensures that we can't fire the firearm out of battery. If it is out of battery enough, this detent cannot raise up, and as a result, our trigger will remain deactivated. The only thing left to show is the spring that acts upon the hammer. So this is the main spring for the hammer here. It's actually a coil spring in this instance, not a flat spring like what we saw in the Colt Single Action Army, but it works in a similar way. So as the steer allows the hammer to drop, the compressed spring is going to use its tension to push upwards, pushing on this bar, which is going to rotate the hammer around and down onto the firing pin. And then when the hammer is cocked again, the bar pushes down onto the spring, compressing it, allowing it to release its tension again when the sear allows the hammer to drop again. So not all that different from the way that the Colt Single Action Army worked. Just the placement of the spring and the type of spring is, is really the main difference. Otherwise, more or less the same system. The next firearm we're going to take a look at, the Colt Python, is an example of an additional feature in a hammer-fired system, and that is a double-action mode. Now, like the single-action system, where the trigger pull achieved a single action or task, that being the dropping of the hammer once it was cocked, the double action system will complete two tasks or two actions with a single trigger pull. That will be bringing back the hammer to the cock position and then dropping it. All in that one trigger pull. And although the parts we're looking at right now may look quite a bit different than those we found on the Colt single action army. And there is quite a lot going on in the design of the Colt Python. A number of the parts you can't even see right now because I have made them invisible. The overall function of how this system works is actually not that much different. And if we start off slowing things down as we have before, we can kind of demonstrate those similarities. So with the cocking of the hammer here, I can place the firearm in the single action mode thus eliminating one of the actions that the trigger could do if I was not cocking the hammer. And as we can see here, the trigger is going to pivot as we cock the hammer. And once we get to the end of that pivot, the sear, which is here at the end of the trigger, again, similar to the way it was on the Colt Single Action Army, where the sear was directly attached to the trigger, it's going to lock into the notch on the hammer here. So the notch isn't as obvious as it was on other hammers we've seen, but it's still there if you look for it. With the pull of the trigger, we're going to have a similar interaction to what we've seen before. The trigger is going to pivot the sear up and away, breaking its contact from the notch and the hammer. Once that contact is broken, the hammer is free to move and it is driven forward and down onto the firing pin. This time, the hammer does not contain its own firing pin. Instead, the frame has the firing pin, but the hammer here will strike the firing pin, transferring that energy to the primer, igniting the cartridge. And the hammer is driven by its mainspring here, which we have x-rayed at the moment. Let's go ahead and bring that x-ray out so you can see the mainspring. So it is a folded flat spring right here. After driving the hammer forward and down on the firing pin, the mainspring is not actually finished releasing its tension. It continues to release its tension downward through the other side of the flat spring onto this bar. And this bar interacts directly with the trigger here, as we can see, returning it back down. 
But from now on, we're just going to focus on the hammer assembly and the trigger and sear itself. This time around, we're going to utilize the double action mode. So with the trigger pull, we're going to have a little bit of a different interaction. Instead of the hammer getting cocked and the sear working with this notch here and the hammer, instead, the sear is going to interact with this finger here, which is articulated and directly attached to the hammer. As it pushes up on that finger, the hammer is being cocked. Now eventually, the sear is going to reach a point where it is going to pivot free of this finger. At this point, the hammer drops free, and we have just completed our double action cycle. And our trigger will now return via its return spring, pushing down on the finger, which is spring-loaded, And once the sear passes this finger, that spring will push it back out so that it can be interacted with again. So, during the double action mode, the hammer is not actually dropped from the same height it is in the single action mode, but it's not that much of a difference. And it's still enough of a drop that it can fire off the round after striking the firing pin. The last feature of the Colt Python I'm going to showcase before I wrap up my talk on it is the transfer bar, which is right here. Now, a transfer bar is a mechanism on modern revolvers that make them safe to carry loaded with the hammer in the forward position. As we discussed with the Colt Single Action Army, the hammer in the forward position, it's possible to strike the rear of the hammer and transfer that energy into the firing pin and then into the primer, inadvertently firing off a cartridge. With a transfer bar mechanism, there is going to be a physical piece in between the hammer and the frame to prevent it from coming fully forward and transferring that energy to the firing pin. So with the transfer bar here, as far forward as the hammer could move with that transfer bar being there, it could not actually contact the firing pin. Now the job of the transfer bar though is to move out of the way when the trigger is pulled, when you actually want to fire the revolver. So we can see that happen as the trigger is pulled. The transfer bar will be pulled down out of the way. And this happens because of this bar here, which is going to cam with the trigger. So as the trigger pivots, there's a pin through the trigger that's going to ride in this track in this bar. And as that pin rides that track, it's going to pivot this bar upwards, which is going to pull downwards through a direct attachment with the transfer bar and bring it out of the way. With it out of the way, as the hammer drops forward, we can see that it's, the transfer bar is no longer in the way, so the hammer can drop fully forward. And then as the trigger returns back, it's also going to pull that transfer bar back in place and then block the hammer yet again. Now we can also see that this occurs when we cock back the hammer. As the cocking of the hammer is going to also pivot the trigger, it's still going to ride along this track and bring the transfer bar down. So with the firearm in the cock position like this, the transfer bar is being held down. But this is not how you would normally carry a revolver of this type loaded if you weren't ready to shoot it. So if you're going to carry it normally, a double action revolver of this type, you would decock it and bring that transfer bar back into place so that you could safely carry it. Only when you were ready to shoot it would you cock the hammer like this. The next example we're going to look at, the Ruger LCR, is an example of the fact that although you may not be able to see 
a hammer on the outside of the firearm, that does not mean that it is not a hammer fired action. So if we go ahead and x-ray down, we can see the hammer on the inside of the firearm, making it still a hammer fired action. And although the mechanism of the Ruger OCR is very similar to that of the Colt Python, there are some differences that I think are worth looking at. Not only the fact that the hammer is internal, but also this is a double action only handgun, which means that you cannot ever use the single action mode with this firearm. But if we take a look at the operation of the action, we have the trigger pull. And just like with the Colt Python, we have an articulated finger here attached to the hammer that our sear is going to drive upward. Now, one big difference is the fact that once the sear breaks contact with that articulated finger, the hammer isn't yet going to drop because it has a new interaction with this part of the hammer and this part of the sear. So the sear actually has two fingers on it or two teeth. And it's not until the hammer breaks contact with that second tooth that it'll actually drop forward and then strike the firing pin and ignite the cartridge. And then the return spring of the trigger brings it back down into its original position. Another key difference between the Colt Python and the Ruger LCR is how the transfer bar works. Now the transfer bar is this piece here. And rather than with the Colt Python where it blocks the hammer from striking the firing pin, instead it actually does the opposite. So as we pull the trigger, the transfer bar is actually driven in between the firing pin and the hammer. And the hammer will directly contact the transfer bar. And I know you can't really see it very well here. And honestly, the animation of the hammer here is just terrible as it clips through the transfer bar here, but it's going to strike the transfer bar. And then, then it's the transfer bar that is going to transfer as the name of the transfer bar implies the energy to the firing pin, igniting the cartridge without the transfer bar in between the hammer and the firing pin. It is not possible for the hammer to strike the firing pin. As you can see, there's a cutout in the hammer exactly where the firing pin is that prevents it from actually making direct contact. The frame here prevents the hammer from going any more, any further forward than it currently is. So it needs this interaction with the transfer bar to actually strike the firing pin. So it's a very similar idea. It just more or less the opposite way of achieving that idea to that of the Colt Python. The next firearm I'm going to talk about is the CZ-75, which is an example of a double action, single action, semi-automatic handgun. Like a double action revolver, a double action, single action handgun can be utilized in either double action mode with the trigger both cocking and dropping the hammer or single action mode where it only drops the hammer after it is already cocked. Just like with a single action semi-automatic handgun, the hammer will be cocked automatically by the slide after each shot. The only instance where a double action, single action, semi-automatic handgun will be fired in double action mode is if the user has manually decocked the hammer. As loading in a new round in the chamber will cock the hammer just the same as shooting off a shot. So this has to be a conscious decision by the owner of the firearm to decock it into the double action mode. Comparatively, double action, single action, semi-automatic handguns can have quite a bit of difference in how the particular parts function, but they all have the same overall basic goals that they need to achieve. And because they have the same goals, there will be similarities in their design. One of the main obstacles for me demonstrating how a double action, single action uh, handgun works is the fact that in this program, 
With the semi-automatic handguns, it is impossible to operate them in double action mode. They will only function in single action. So you're going to have to use a little bit of your imagination, and I'm going to try my best to explain and describe how the handgun works in the double action mode. With all that said, let's go ahead and take a look at the function of the firearm in the single action mode. And to start off, let's go ahead and identify the major parts. We have the hammer here. We have the sear which is locked into the notch in the hammer, as the hammer is fully cocked at the moment. We have the trigger, which is attached to the trigger bar here. So as we pull the trigger, the trigger is going to pivot, which is going to push the trigger bar to the rear. As the trigger bar gets pushed to the rear, it's going to make contact with this part of the sear. And once it makes contact with that part of the sear, it's going to push that part backwards, which is going to cause the sear to pivot up and out of contact with the hammer. And once the sear breaks free of the notch in the hammer, the hammer is free to move and will drop forward onto the firing pin. Now, if we take a look over here, you rem may remember a part of the functionality of the 1911 and that there was a cutout in the slide, and this is going to be a little bit hard for you to see, but I'm going to try and zoom on it, in on it as best as I can. But you might just be able to make out this line here, and there's another line on the other side, which you might just be able to make out here. This is a cutout in the slide, and what this does is it interacts with this hump here on the trigger bar. So as the slide recoils, Eventually, the hump on the trigger bar is going to make contact with the ramped edge of the cutout in the slide and be pushed down once that it leaves that cutout. And this is going to have the same effect that it had in the 1911. It's going to break contact of the trigger bar and its activation of the sear. Now this part here isn't actually the sear, it's a separate part that we'll demonstrate a little bit later what that does. But there's a, another surface here on the other side of the sear that is more or less in the same spot and works more or less the same way. And as the slide recoils, it's going to cock back the hammer. And then as the slide comes forward, the hammer is going to start to come forward with it. But because now the sear is free to move on its own without being affected by the trigger bar, it's going to be in place to lock into the notch in the hammer, preventing the hammer from coming forward. Again, similar to the functionality of the 1911. And as the trigger bar starts to come up as it comes into the cutout here and the slide it will raise up and eventually be able to again interact with the sear. Well, the one thing I want to point out here is you might be curious just like what we had with the 1911. The 1911 wasn't able to fire out of battery either because of the cutout and the slide preventing the trigger bar from activating the sear and dropping the hammer prematurely. And you might be wondering here, it appears that the trigger bar moves up into a position where it could activate the sear here, even though the slide isn't in battery. But the one thing I'll point out is if you actually held in the trigger the whole time, the, uh, slide was moving forward, you would still be holding it back. See, what's happening in this animation is the trigger is actually coming forward. So if you held the trigger back, it would not move forward. It would move up, but it would not move forward. So what would happen is this surface area here at the top of the trigger bar would contact the bottom edge of the sear, and the sear, I mean, the trigger bar would still be below the sear. So if you, if you held in the trigger this whole time, the trigger bar would not trip the sear. It would still be below this surface. It's not until you let go the trigger and let it reset that you could fire it again. So at this point here, if you were to let the trigger out this far, 
at the moment the slide goes into battery, you could pull the trigger again and fire it immediately. And this would actually result in a lot of the take up, uh, take up of the trigger already being traveled. So normally, if you let the trigger go out all the way, like, like this, there would be this much distance before the trigger bar would contact the sear. But if you held in the trigger a little bit to right there, this is where the trigger resets. If you ever hear somebody talk about trigger reset, this is kind of what they're talking about. This is the point where you have the minimum of the forward travel of the trigger where you can still activate the trigger bar and activate the sear. So if you held it in this far, you held in the trigger this far, didn't matter how much you push the trigger, nothing would happen. But if you let the trigger come forward this far, once the slide goes into battery, you could pull the trigger again and immediately activate the sear. So I hope that explains a little bit how trigger reset works in detail. There's one piece left to explain before we move on to the double action mode, and that's this piece right here. And I promised that I'd tell you what it did. And it is part of the firing pin safety or firing pin block. So this here is the firing pin block. And what it does is it physically blocks the firing pin by fitting into this cutout here from moving any further forward. So if you were to strike the back of the firing pin right now, this block would prevent the firing pin from moving any further forward and striking the primer. This is meant to only be activated when the trigger is pulled. So if we watch as the trigger bar travels backwards, it's going to activate this piece here. At the same time, it's going to activate the sear. And as it pivots that piece up, it's going to push upwards on the block. And as the block gets pushed upwards, it's going to break its contact with the firing pin, allowing it to travel forward. Like so. And once it breaks its contact with this piece here, the spring here will drive the firing pin block down, back down, again preventing the firing pin from moving forward until the, this piece here is activated. So it is a safety feature that you'll find in a lot of modern semi-automatics. Pretty simple in mechanism, but it ensures that the firing pin can only move when the trigger is pulled. Now is the time I'm going to have to ask you to use quite a bit of your imagination as we go over the functionality of the double action mode in the CZ75. So the two main important parts for the double action mode is this piece here and its interaction with the trigger bar. Now, one thing I'd like to point out here is there is one interaction that we haven't yet seen, and to see it, I'm actually going to have to bring the x-ray out a little bit. And the reason you haven't seen this view yet is because it blocks quite a lot of the parts I want you to see. But the thing I want you to keep in mind is that this part, the trigger bar, is right now in direct contact with this central part, which is pinned to the hammer. But as we bring that trigger bar forward, we see that it's going to cam along this outer part here that we haven't yet seen and be driven down. Now what's important about this is the fact that it is what allows the trigger bar to break free of the contact with this piece attached to the hammer because we don't want those two parts to interact with each other anymore in the single action mode. And also in the double action mode, we're also going to want them to break free of each other at some point. Now, this is the position that this piece attached to the hammer would be in with the hammer in the forward position. And the thing that you also have to keep in mind is that the trigger bar would also be further back in the double action mode. So this is where it is in the single action mode. But in double action, the trigger would be further forward. And as a result, it would pull the trigger bar further back as well. So the position of the trigger bar at the moment is not the position it would have for the double action mode. It'd actually be further forward. So when we bring this piece forward, the part of your imagination you're going to have to use is the fact that 
But if this were in double action mode and the trigger had reset, that this trigger bar would actually be in front of this piece attached to the hammer. And as we pull the trigger, the trigger bar is going to be pushed backwards. And as it gets pushed backwards, it's also going to push backwards on this piece attached to the hammer. And as this piece travels backwards, it's going to cause the hammer to pivot down and back. As we can see here. So you're just going to have to use your imagination and imagine that the trigger bar is what's forcing this to move. And then once it gets to this point, the point where the trigger bar and this piece attached to the hammer would break apart because the sear is already holding the hammer back. The trigger bar and that piece will break free and then just like what we had in the single action mode, the trigger bar is going to trip the sear. But this piece here and the interaction with the trigger bar is how we get that double action functionality. One of the action being cocking the hammer and then the other action tripping the sear and that functions exactly the way it did when we were just operating the firearm in the single action mode and that's going to wrap things up for this video there's a lot still that i wanted to and could have uh, included in this video but due to uh, length considerations i am going to omit for instance, uh, I plan to cover an AR-15 and an AK-47 to showcase that they are also hammer-fired uh, and go along that principle. Even if you can't see a hammer, it doesn't mean it isn't hammer-fired. But I think that they're going to be the subject of a separate video when I cover select fire functionality and firearms. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. This is Mouse Gunner signing out.